Good afternoon, not evening, with daylight saving time. Uh, my name is Dorothée Humbert, and as head of landscape architecture at the Norton School, I have the great pleasure to introduce tonight's lecturer, Liat Margolis. Liat Margolis is currently an associate professor of landscape architecture at Toronto Daniels, where she not only serves as the director of the MLA program, but also as the associate dean of research. She should know that when you do too good of a job, they always ask you to do more. It is a great satisfaction for Paula Meyerink and myself to have Liat visit, as we have known her for 15 years, back when she was a student at Harvard GSD. Liat Margolis was a memorable student, not because of the rapid color succession of her hair, which always threw me back when I did a desk rate and I didn't recognize her, but rather because of her self-motivation. As a graduate student, she co-founded and directed the materials collection in the basement of the Harvard GSD and developed her first book from this early interest. The resulting Living Systems, Innovative Materials and Technologies for Landscape Architecture, co-authored with Alex Robinson, who is currently at USC, was published by Birkhäuser in 2007. It made those of us who write for rather obscure, on rather obscure topics and for minimal audiences more than a bit envious, as within two years, the book was translated into German, French, and Chinese. This project and the materials collection were neither a beginning nor an end for Liette Margolis. They formed the next step to her undergraduate education in industrial design at RISD and her directing research at Material Connection in New York. They also offered a stepping stone to her academic research. Although she comes to us from the cold, she has not forgotten her Israeli origins and a concern for drought. She co-authored with Aziza Shauni, Out of Water, Design Solutions for Arid Regions, which was published by Birkhäuser in 2014. She also contributed papers and essays on water infrastructure and innovative technology in Jordan. More recently, and closer to her home base in Toronto, Liat Margolis has founded the GRIT Lab, the Green Roof Innovation Testing Laboratory at Toronto Daniels, which she now directs. Grid Lab includes 33 green roof test beds, three green walls, a weather station, and 270 sensors that collect data on soil moisture, temperature, rainfall, solar exposure, and wind every five minutes to provide metrics for so-called green and clean technologies. In turn, interdisciplinary research on the performance of green roofs and green walls informs urban water management policy and green building standards. She can also play the grand game and has secured significant funding from the Canadian Fed federal government and the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council, as well as garden support from industrial partners. She received a 2013 Award of Excellence in Research from the American Society of Landscape Architects and is now sitting on the prestigious University of Toronto Presidential Committee on the Environment, Climate Change and Sustainability. She's also committed to diversity and social justice. She has created, with the Indigenous Elders and the Regional Conservation Authority, a new program that combines Indigenous teachings, landscape architecture, and environmental conservation field work for Indigenous high school students. She's the rare design nerd that can speak to a multiplicity of audiences, from the scientific and landscape architecture communities to the general public and in doing so, integrates green, blue, and social infrastructure. Please join me in welcoming Liat Margolis. Thank you, Paula, uh, for inviting me. It's um, very um, lovely to be here once again. Um, I was here in 2008 when the building was just finished, and it's so nice to see the kind of energy in the building and the uh, extraordinary the work that's being done in studios. Um, so to tonight I want to share with you um, the work that I've been doing uh, at the University of Toronto uh, with the GRIT Lab, um, essentially since 2009 when, when I arrived there, so now 10 years. And the title of my talk uh, tonight is Shades of Green. Um, and the reason for that is, um, is because uh, in the last 20 years, we've all noticed a kind of increased uh, awareness and importance um, and, and the kind of metrics by which landscape architecture 
uh, and landscape architecture projects are measured for their uh, success according to their environmental performance. And that green standards have become a real uh, kind of standard, uh, ubiquitous standard um, for most projects. Um, and the question that always interested me is uh, with regards to looking at how landscapes are constructed and how material configurations are actually affecting uh, performance is a question of um, how green are we? How green is green? Um, and the second question that this talk will address um, is thinking about a kind of a self-reflective process and the role uh, as an academic within an academic institution, what that has afforded me uh, the kind of privilege that I have as an academic um, to develop uh, both a criticality around um, environmental performance and also um, thinking about an engaged practice, what th that means, um, as well as an evidence-based research on green infrastructure and sustainability and what does that mean in terms of pedagogy, research, um, and the kind of impact that we might have uh, on the profession, on policy, on industry, and all the kind of sectors that are coming together to actually uh, forge ahead with pathways towards sustainability. So shortly after I arrived at, uh, in Toronto, the city of Toronto has done uh, something that was quite progressive and launched the very first and only uh, green roof bylaw in North America, which essentially mandates that all uh, new construction above 6,000 square feet must have a green roof. To, they, to, to date, uh, Toronto has 6 million square feet in um, green roofing, which surpasses any city uh, in North America. Um, and this came about uh, after a seminal paper that was published by Ryerson University, which did a kind of a simulation on what would be the implications for water management, stormwater management, flood reduction relative to climate change adaptation, um, and what would be the kind of urban cooling uh, impacts of green roof. And, and that paper basically convinced the city uh, to, uh, in some ways, put the cart before the horse um, before testing any of these kind of performance metrics relative to the Toronto climate um, and put this legislation, a very progressive legislation, forward. Now, this green roof bylaw is not a standalone. And what's interesting is the kind of confluence of policy that's happening in Toronto uh, in which this is just one mechanism out of many looking at landscape as infrastructure, looking at kind of ecosystem services on a wide regional all the way to a material architectural detail. 2013, the city adopted its wet weather flow uh, management, which has now gone into a second uh, revision mandating that all new uh, properties, uh, new construction, hold on to 90% of stormwater runoff. Um, a really extraordinary 2005 green belt uh, around the city of Toronto, uh, two million acres of uh, protection uh, for no development around, um, around uh, the city of Toronto, the city of Toronto there in uh, pink, you, and you can see the kind of the seven river sheds that cut through the cities as a kind of a post-glacial uh, remnant, which is the, the main geographical feature of Toronto. And the green belt is meant to protect the headwaters of all of that, um, all of that watershed uh, running into Lake Ontario. The Toronto Ravine strategy then followed looking at the protection of all of these ravines, and this dates back to the Toronto Region Conservation Authority's efforts since the 1950s post-Hurricane Hazel, which basically allows them to uh, have the jurisdiction for all the watersheds. They can actually take developers to court uh, if they deem their development compromising. Uh, 
the hydrological and ecological health of these ravines. So this is 40,000 acres of land that is managed by the Toronto Region Conservation Authority. The city now has 27% uh, urban canopy cover uh, and its, its objective is to go up to 40% canopy cover um, with mo 1 million trees uh, as an objective to plant on private property. Uh, interestingly, part of the province um, uh, official plan green infrastructure was finally added alongside gray infrastructure, uh, acknowledging the landscape has the same regulatory uh, environmental regulation potential as a pipe or you know a road, and that we should value them in um, along the same um, kind of uh, um, valuation systems. The Toronto Green Standard, which is the kind of the localized version of the lead for uh, building, under which the Toronto uh, Green Roof Standard comes in. Most recently, the Green Streets Technical Guidelines, looking at the implementation and the retrofit of uh, streets to hold on to stormwater runoff, um, and looking also at other things like mobility, bike mobility, and so on. Uh, biodiversity in green roofs, um, the pollinator protection uh, strategy, looking at Toronto as bee city, and most recently, still in draft form, a biodiversity strategy for the city of Toronto. So this is the kind of context in which green roofs and where my work has been, looking at the kind of the policies, the matrix of policies that are happening uh, and that are, that are being um, adopted by the city of Toronto and looking at how um, the legislation and the construction standards fit within the performance objectives that the city has. The other thing that I think is worth kind of contextualizing is this idea of metrics in general, which has become over the last couple of decades um, a, uh, a way in which that we understand ecosystem uh, services and that that has become part of uh, economics parlance. Uh, in other words, you have, for instance, uh, TD Bank evaluating Toronto's uh, urban canopy at $7 billion, $80 million annually uh, in ecosystem services from stormwater management, urban cooling, uh, carbon sequestration, air quality, and so on. Uh, and then conversely, looking at offsetting uh, 19 million tons of air pollution uh, uh, through car emissions per year. And yet, uh, another kind of uh, parallel track to looking at all the literature on, on uh, performance metrics relative to ecosystem services is another kind of literature around the performance gap looking at this idea that there are three or four rather main performance gaps that we're looking at. One is between projected and actual performance. So we think we're doing something really good, um, but in reality, it's, it's not quite hitting the mark. So for instance, a study came out uh, several years ago around lead buildings, 100 lead buildings that were studied, 30 uh, of which um, were underperforming, 30 of which hit the mark, 30 of which overperformed. In other words, we, are, we only know 30%. Uh, and wouldn't it be important to know not only where we're underperforming, but also where we're overperforming? And that kind of question around uh, workflow and how do we look at performance monitoring as feeding back into the professional practice so that we can look at how we actually optimize what we're doing, how we're changing standards, and what are these kind of feedback loops into the profession, into policy, into industry and material manufacturing. The other is disciplinary, and we're looking at really complex systems, right? Living systems are, uh, are, can be studied in, in, in so many different ways, and they're often studied in silos while we know that the issues are actually cross-cutting and actually interdependent. And not only 
not always in synergy with one another. Sometimes you have incongruities between performance uh, objectives or actual performance. The third is sectoral. And what's happening in terms of academic research, what's happening in industry, sometimes among many different industries, what's happening in policy, those are running in, in their own tracks and in their own timelines, right? Subject to their own kind of uh, regulations and cycles of uh, mayors and government and uh, manufacturing timelines and investments and academic work and publishing and grant funding. These are all working in different cycles and these are also problematic. And then regional. Uh, living systems are not cut and paste. And science that is generated in Singapore around green roofs cannot be cut and paste to Toronto and so on and so forth. And then, and then the other aspect is that when you're talking about uh, uh, materials, you're really talking about material flows that are locally mined. And so looking at the kind of con context of where materials are coming from for that industry is also really important. So that's the kind of the context um, to the work and, and granted, all of this I'm able to say after 10 years of thinking about it because when I entered this in 2009, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Um, but what was really interesting was that the City of Toronto had adopted its Green Roof Bylaw and never tested the construction standard. And immediately that provided with an opportunity um, with uh, seed funding from the City of Toronto, in fact, and then industry collaborations that provided much of the funding for the construction of the, um, of the lab to do an empirical study, an evidence-based study, looking at the common industry practices relative to some of the performance uh, ambitions in Toronto and uh, making this something that is really regionally uh, specific. And that is something that is happening um, across uh, in science with many colleagues who are doing similar work in various other regions, uh, you know, where we're really kind of looking at Green Roofs 2.0. And we know that Green Roofs work, and the same thing could be said for a lot of other technologies or, or landscape um, uh, or ecological systems. Um, so for instance, on average, any green roof uh, um, will hold on to 50% of water annually. That's, that's quite a bit of impact when you're thinking about water retention relative to flood mitigation or runoff reduction, right? So we know that they're good and the questions are more about can we get even better? Um, uh, because the notion of, um, uh, of, of, of optimization is this, this idea that there is really no free lunch. Uh, everything that we um, have has been extracted, mined, manufactured. There are emissions that are um, involved uh, or, or emitted in manufacturing and in transportation. Uh, there's, there's carbon um, that's, that's emitted. Um, and so, what, how do we evaluate the kind of the performance benefits that we have relative to the uh, environmental impact of uh, the materials that we put forth, even if they are seemingly green? And this is uh, an image of this another setup on our roof where we're looking at a combination of solar technologies and green roofs together. Uh, currently, the two industries are at odds with one another, competing for the same roofscape. Um, so we're asking ourselves, how can we think about a kind of a multi-objective performance, not only with respect to the performances with, for the green roofs themselves, but how do we look at, for instance, um, climate change mitigation uh, via renewable energy, and climate change adaptation via green roofs in terms of, let's say, flood mitigation, um, habitat provision, and so on. Why can't we think of these systems um, together? And the other thing is that if we 
if we are thinking about multi, multiple objectives um, and optimization, we have to think in an interdisciplinary way. And the only way to really move forward with this kind of research is to break the silos and look at where all the kind of expertise lies in, in and around the university and elsewhere in industry and in, in, uh, in government to really bring uh, some of this uh, work uh, forward. So as Dorothe mentioned, uh, in uh, 2011, we, we set up 33 test beds um, on our former uh, faculty <coughs> building um, on the fifth story. And this was to essentially study extensive green roofs, which are the, uh, the kind of the common uh, green roofs that are being uh, employed. Uh, so that's six uh, inches, uh, a maximum of six inches. And the main performance criteria that we were looking at are stormwater management. Um, and so for many older cities uh, like Toronto, um, where you have combined storm sewer, you're dealing with surges of storms um, with uh, not only f uh, flooding, but also contaminants that are ending up in, uh, in waterways and water bodies. Thermal cooling uh, is another major aspect of, uh, of urban concern, looking at all the kind of surfaces, roofscapes, and, and asphalt uh, around the city that contributes to uh, urban heat island and consequently the need for excessive uh, cooling um, and then in turn more fuel use, et cetera, et cetera, this kind of vicious cycle not to mention the health impact of, of, uh, of uh, increased heat, which you know, plenty of papers are talking about these days. Plant growth and biodiversity, how do we look at uh, the, this kind of a green roof as compensating for the loss of ecological habitat in areas? And then for us in particular, um, looking at pollinators, uh, pollinator habitats. And then ultimately, we're asking ourselves which design parameters are most significant for water capture, thermal cooling, plant cover, and pollinator habitat. The experimental design, uh, we have 33 test beds, and we have a kind of uh, mini roofscapes. Um, so they're uh, wooden structures with an inverted roof and a membrane and flashing, um, a drainage board, uh, filter cloth, uh, growing media, vegetation, and uh, irrigation on top of that. And that's been constructed and in, still in monitored since 2011, so in its eighth year now. So this is kind of a, a, a summary of the, uh, of the experimental design, uh, what's called a multifactorial uh, experimental design, looking at multiple design factors and trying to correlate them in different configurations, how they actually impact the performance, the four performances that we're looking at. Um, you have the design variables in the middle there. And then what we're looking at are the alternatives to what the City of Toronto either requires or recommends. Um, and so what they recommend in terms of the growing media is um, what follows the German standard uh, abbreviated FLL. And you can see that on the left there. It's a highly mineral um, aggregate content, very low organic content designed to be fast draining. Um, and to support primarily xeric planting, like sedum, things that are, can withstand very, and tolerate uh, drought and very low nutrients. In contrast, what came out with, uh, what, what came up with conversation with industry is a biologically derived uh, wood compost based, high organic content designed to be uh, really high absorptive, and you can see the kind of graph. This is just a kind of an in-house lab test looking at the soil moisture um, capacity of the two different growing media. The left being uh, probably uh, applied 
I'd say 90% of the time across North America, not just in Toronto. The other prevalent plant selection is the sedum mat. And these are oftentimes pre-grown. Um, and uh, out of the 30,000 papers on green roofs worldwide, amazing, right? Uh, many of them are actually looking at sedum. So the bottom line is that they are uh, applicable to so many climate regions. Um, and they're chosen because uh, they oftentimes maintain uh, their cover. And cover is one of the main me me metrics or, or uh, metrics by which green roofs are measured in the city of Toronto uh, as well. Um, and this is how it comes. It comes in these kind of rolled mats. Uh, you can cut them with scissors. Uh, they're very easy to install. So that's another uh, plus and benefit and why people or installers uh, like sedum. And then upon ribbon cutting, you have an already kind of a finished landscape. It's green. You don't have to wait for the seed to actually uh, take hold and for the, uh, to germinate and for the plants to establish. So, you know, that's another, another plus. In contrast, we looked at, um, again, things that we learned from industry is a selection of 16 uh, grasses and uh, forbs, uh, herbaceous flowering uh, planting that were native to uh, Toronto, but also um, native to a kind of a wider spectrum of, a, of, a, of a regions, um, uh, the kind of plants that you might find in rural conditions on the side of a road, uh, your yarrows and black-eyed Susans and Echinacea and Liatris and uh, Primrose and so on. Uh, and things that green roofers have told us pretty much are, are working really well. And there, there are a couple of principles there. One is the sedum is a non-native species to Canada. And I'll get to that in, in, in a few slides. Um, while the um, grasses and forbs are um, native to, uh, to the area uh, and also have a much wider diversity. In other words, they, what uh, in ecology is called functional niches, right? That you have the tall shading plants uh, that suck up a lot of water. You have creeping plants that provide with a kind of uh, ground cover. Um, and if one species fails for one reason or another, others can compensate. Well, when you have a monoculture, uh, even though you have multiple cultivars with the sedum, um, if, if anything, uh, if, 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 if faced with any sort of adversity, then you have a kind of a massive die-off. With regards to supplemental irrigation, the city of Toronto recommends water conservation. And then, uh, uh, you know, in turn, LEED gives points for non-irrigated landscapes. So what is happening in the industry is that you have essentially either non-irrigated landscapes uh, or green roofs. And the industry um, essentially advocates for that and, and promotes the idea that uh, green roofs are maintenance free. Um, and then the other uh, common uh, practice is automated irrigation, so daily irrigation. And what we wanted to look at is soil moisture activated irrigation, so what's called on-demand irrigation. So three different uh, irrigation treatments. So we, all in all, we have uh, the two different uh, soil types or growing media types. We also have two different depths, the four inches, which is the minimum that the city requires. And then we wanted to look at six inches to see if that would make a difference if we actually went uh, deeper. Um, and we have the two planting types and the three irrigation regimes, and those are all uh, interspersed and co-mixed. Everything is censored. Uh, with instruments. So uh, just for the green roof uh, setup alone, we have tw 270 uh, sensors that are recording uh, temperature, surface temperature, air temperature, soil moisture, and, uh, and water discharge from each one of the test beds uh, in five minute intervals. 
and that's a, a, a rendering showing the kind of the uh, thermal profile above the bed, and that goes through the bed and underneath the bed. Uh, we have an infrared sensor that looks at surface temperature. Uh, we have a tipping bucket rain gauge that looks at uh, rates of discharge and a soil moisture sensor inside of the bed. And these, this is all the kind of design that our students are, are doing, looking at all this kind of the sensor instrumentation and, and installation and wiring and coding and programming. Um, and then each bed is then compared to our weather station that's on site, also recording uh, weather data. So for instance, we can know uh, the duration and the intensity of a storm. Um, we can look at the total volume and, um, and then duration and compare that to how much water was discharged from each bed, uh, how much then goes into evaporation or evapotranspiration, and what's the delay in to the peak of the storm, which is what engineers are really concerned with, is actually how, how can you offset, hold on to the water while there's a large storm moving through the city, and then once the storm is out, then it could start trickling down. And just to show you what our students are involved with, 5,000 linear feet of cable just for the green roof setup alone uh, that they had to uh, wire and code and, uh, and, 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 and figure all of that out. Um, uh, in parallel to the green roof setup, we also looked at green facades um, and uh, uh, looking at what are, what's the, uh, thermoregulatory potential of green facades on uh, building envelopes. And actually, um, in the background there on the top, you can see the weather station. We censored uh, all the wall with surface temperatures, looking at uh, correlating essentially vine growth over the full summer and looking at three different growth forms of vines. Some that, for instance, uh, you know, shoot right straight up and then, uh, or, or, or some that have a kind of a horizontal growth form and so on and so forth, and how that would affect the uh, cover of the wall and then the temperature cooling relative to exposed wall. And then um, shortly after we finished the, th those installations, we started with another installation which was uh, quite challenging, looking at the combination of solar and green roof. And here, um, the question was, um, are there benefits in combining green roof with solar photovoltaic arrays? And as, as I mentioned before, the two industries are at odds with one another, the green roof uh, industry uh, vying for the fact that they're providing with uh, stormwater management and habitat primarily, and also surface cooling. Um, while the solar industry is basically saying, well, with regards to energy uh, insulation for the, for the building or any sort of cooling, the impact on energy, in other words, is negligible relative to renewable energy. You should just put solar up there, forget the green roof. So here are the two uh, industries at odds, and we were saying, why either or, why not both? Uh, we are the first uh, and only that I know of academic uh, institute that has this kind of an installation and study in Canada. Uh, and very few around the world, there are about a handful of them that I'm aware of, that are actually looking at the combination, what would be the optimal kind of height between uh, roofing, what is the effect of temperature on energy production. So just so you know, solar energy is, a, is the best products out there on the market are just about 18% efficiency, which means that by the time you finish your costs, you are looking at a kind of an eight to 10 year rate of return on your investment, which is quite significant to a developer or a building owner operator. Um, then energy, uh, the, the uh, energy production and the lifetime of PV panels decrease as they're overheated. So if they're on top of a conventional rooftop, they're overheated, their energy production and lifetime decreases, and you're cutting into your costs even further. So what 
uh, what we were looking at is can we actually optimize energy production um, by maintaining a cool ambient temperature below uh, solar panels uh, and at the same time have the co-benefits of water management and habitat. But uh, there are still questions around what's the effect of shading on plant growth, given that uh, cooling is uh, a byproduct of evapotranspiration and you need solar exposure for uh, transpiration of plants. And then what would be the kind of water balance and, um, and uh, stormwater management, given that you have variable water conditions uh, in, in shade of rain and uh, in a drip line of rain and what, how that would begin to affect the installation. And then ultimately, what would be the kind of the optimal height between uh, the green roof and the solar panels? Um, and we worked very closely with the university looking at uh, this installation uh, being a, a, a 40 panel, uh, 11 kilowatt uh, uh, setup to feed into the grid of the U of T, in other words, being part of their low carbon portfolio. So all in all, this is the uh, rendering of the setup on, uh, on our old building, the first lab that, that, uh, that we started with the three areas of installation. And one thing that I, I think uh, has been really important is the kind of long, <clears throat> excuse me, the long-term monitoring uh, of these setups. So a lot of studies are kind of looking at a one-year or two-year, um, excuse me, um, study, but what we're finding is that the kind of um, succession of plants and the kind of uh, uh, effects on planting, the design factors effects on plant growth is only really apparent and evident uh, further down the line. So we have, you know, over 15 now science papers that have been um, published uh, in, in various uh, uh, journals and all of which are interdisciplinary and trying to bring all of these kind of lenses uh, together. And, uh, and that, uh, these kind of uh, findings have begun to now uh, influence the policies that I uh, mentioned to you before and looking and questioning and revisiting the standards um, and the kind of nuanced language around uh, performance, uh, not only for green roofs, but also in, in other aspects of plant selection, soil uh, relationship with plants and water management and so on. Um, the, the other thing that's been really important for us is, is looking at dissemination and public outreach, given that so many of these policies are subject to um, political will and a kind of a wide understanding by the public of why these things are actually important. Um, and this is an image of Doors Open Toronto where we hosted over one weekend uh, over 200 people. Um, and we oftentimes do uh, these kind of presentations to professional groups and special interest groups, schools and, uh, and so on. Now, just a bit of a glimpse, uh, uh, you know, in terms of the performance gap that I mentioned earlier, and maybe just a couple of highlights to mention in terms of what we found that was um, different than what the common standards uh, in the industry and what the policy was calling for. So the prevalent industry practice uh, is the mineral aggregate, the sedum, uh, no irrigation, and uh, either four inches or less than four inches. Uh, a lot of installations that we found were at two and a half inches thin. Uh, and that is about 90% of installations in Toronto. And I would say probably the same could be said for uh, North America. What we found was actually that uh, the uh, organic medium uh, far surpassed the, or, uh, the mineral aggregate uh, for stormwater management, 
uh, for thermal cooling and plant growth, particularly for the biodiverse uh, grass form mix. Now, there's a lot of myths in terms of the organics, so they're vilified quite a bit in a lot of areas, uh, regions. One, there is a kind of myth that there is prolonged compaction and loss of organics over time, and we showed, we did a survey of 30 roofs across Toronto at different ages, um, 17 years old in some cases, and looked at no compaction and no loss of organics. And there's a process called pedogenesis, which is the creation of soil through organics, essentially constantly uh, uh, um, in, uh, supplementing the organic content of the soil. And then the other myth is nutrient loading. So nitrogen, phosphorus leaching out of the soil of the organics and ending up in uh, water bodies. Uh, increasing what's called eutrophication or algification of, uh, of, of water bodies and, and the kind of the consequences of that. Uh, and that is also a huge myth. Um, now, green roofs kind of fall between green infrastructure, which is particularly living systems, and low impact development. Green roof is a mechanism of low impact development, but so is a cistern. And so when you compare nutrient loading of a cistern or a porous pavement, well, that's at zero, and a green roof is obviously, uh, 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 you know, has a uh, you know, discharge of nutrients. And still, when you look at it in the uh, grand scheme of things of fertilizers put onto landscapes that are not at all subject to any of that scrutiny, or the wastewater treatment plants in Toronto that are actually putting out nutrients directly into Lake Ontario. It's a minuscule fraction, uh, even if you covered all of Toronto with green roofs with organic soil. So these kind of myth busting is what we've been trying to do um, with the industry. The other is that irrigation is definitely the most significant factor for all three performance criteria, but in opposite ways. So for water retention, it's, it certainly decreases water retention. And if you have daily irrigation, you go down to 30% retention versus average 50%. Um, or if you have the no irrigation, uh, at 70% right, retention, right? So there's a big, big uh, gap there. But it's absolutely necessary in a climate like Toronto, and I think Columbus would fall into the same kind of climate zone of very extreme um, weather patterns, um, is that if there is an objective uh, to have a biodiverse mix, not just the sedum, irrigation is absolutely critical. And what we found is year two into it after uh, uh, drought in, in July, we had essentially full die off of the uh, biodiverse mix, never to actually recover. Uh, and consequently, soil erosion, essentially that bed never returned. It was just dirt. <laughs> Um, and so wh where we found the kind of reconciliation is looking at on-demand irrigation, which not only uh, maintains plant growth, uh, but also achieves 50% uh, water conservation relative to daily irrigation. Um, and so with com uh, the com combination of the on-demand and organic, you can still maintain the 70% uh, retention. And the third is, and this came as a shock to us because we thought that the biodiverse mix, given the fact that it has large biomass, a lot of structure, a lot of uh, you know, surface area to suck up water and evapotranspire, we thought we would get a lot more cooling and a lot better uh, stormwater uh, evapotranspiration or, or that that would play a, a good sort of a, a, a mechanism in that. Uh, to our surprise, sedum was still a top performer. Um, and what we then thought that uh, rather than evapotranspiration, that interception um, plays a role. And that is now looking 
zooming in to the kind of the micro micro of plant surface uh, and material looking at this kind of a waxy cupping structure, these kind of mini puddles uh, and evaporation works faster than transpiration infiltrate, i.e. infiltration into the soil and then an uptake by, um, by the plants. So we ran another study which is now under review uh, for publication looking at uh, what if you actually intermix the two species and what we found was that uh, one actually worked really well during a rain event, uh, so you've got the interception, and then the other worked really well in the post-event transpiration. So conclusion is you can actually achieve both if you mix the two together, then achieving the kind of the biodiversity uh, and the water management in even a more uh, optimal manner. So again, why, why either or, why not both? And why is all this really important when I'm talking about biodiversity, native, non-native? I'm sure you've heard these kind of discussions, a la Peter Del Tredici and others who are advocating for you know, non-natives and uh, versus natives and all, all these kinds of discussions. And one thing that really concerned us uh, was looking at the correlation between plants and pollinators, uh, given that, that, that they are, uh, you see graphs that basically show that the, when there is a decline in vegetation in urban regions, there's a direct decline in pollinators. And the same can be said the opposite. If you have a direct decline in pollinators, you have a direct a decline in, um, in vegetation. Um, and not only that, that there are uh, relationships between certain species and uh, between pollinators and vegetation species. And when I'm talking about pollinators, I'm not talking about the domestic um, social bee, uh, i.e. the non-native European honeybee. I'm talking about, um, which are only eight species around the world. I'm talking about the 20,000 uh, solitary uh, oftentimes either cavity nesters or ground nesting bees, um, 350 which are native to, um, to the city uh, of Toronto. So here's uh, 350 native wild bee species, uh, two thirds of which are ground nesters. Uh, so interesting for those who are working on asphalt and uh, green uh, greening streets and getting rid of all the kind of impervious surfaces that have um, actually uh, completely eradicated uh, pollinator ground nesting habitats. Um, and that's another study that we will do in the future looking at green roof soil as a potential nesting habitat, not only foraging. But what's, uh, what, what we found was that um, with respect to the bees, the pollinators, the, the native pollinators, as i.e. the solitary bees, were attracted to the native meadow species, i.e. The, the grasses and the forbs, um, and the non-native honeybees were attracted to the non-native um, sedum species. And so if we think about it uh, at that 90% of roofscapes, 6 million square feet of rooftops in Toronto are now sedum uh, rooftops, what does that mean in terms of prioritizing ecological habitat for native versus non-native bee species and what does that mean? Nobody has done that study but it's a kind of a question mark, right? The other study that we did, which um, sort of, again, scrutinized the kind of policy that's coming out around Toronto with respect to green roofs should be everywhere. Green roofs should be on every new construction, and we're talking about uh, an average of 150 new towers, um, some of which are 100 stories tall in Toronto yearly. Uh, new towers, right, since, since, the, uh, since about 10 years ago, this kind of constant growth of, of condo towers, office towers uh, in and around Toronto being the fourth largest city in North America now. Um, and what we found, you know, with respect to uh, 
uh, pollinator habitats is that we, we wanted to look at whether there's any correlation between building elevation and bee visitation. And what we found is that after the eighth story, there's really no, very little, if any, bee visitation. And so the idea of designing for biodiversity at the 20th, 40th, 60th story is really not viable. Uh, and this is where we went back into the city and said, um, given the fact that you have a kind of a tower and podium typology that's very common in Toronto, think about the podium as the biodiverse space and what you do up top on the 60th floor, floor could either be something to do with water management or actually just put a white roof up there and reflect the sun and put a cistern on the bottom, but really think about this as a three-dimensional problem and a, and a kind of a, not necessarily just a, a policy to be, um, to be uh, put uh, everywhere. So the conclusion, in other words, we said, okay, site matters, um, and then not all green roofs are created equal, and nor should they be. One thing that uh, for us has been really important is the kind of the partnerships, uh, and the industrial partnerships that we've been working with. And you know, one is that it's a really important mechanism to leverage federal funding for grants and also get their in-kind contributions uh, for materials and construction and, uh, and uh, all of the kind of aspects of, of, of building these installations that are quite, quite complicated. But also in terms of thinking about the research questions. Uh, and these industries have their finger on the pulse. They're the ones constructing things and understanding what's actually happening in the industry, what they're, what they're learning is really feeding into our research uh, questions. And then, and then furthermore, the kind of training opportunities, the, the kind of hands-on opportunities for training uh, students. So all of this has been, and these are just a series of shots of where our students are actually working with our industry partners to construct all of this. Um, and thinking about these as uh, experiential learning and training programs for, um, for all of our students uh, and actually learning hands-on what does it take to uh, build a landscape, look at these technologies, how do you control them um, from all the way from um, uh, going out to see the, how sedum is actually grown. This is, these are the sedum mats in the field in a nursery, pre-grown, then cut, rolled, and uh, shipped uh, here talking to the uh, growers and, and, and um, listening to their woes uh, relative to the industry. Um, and then going also to see all sorts of installations uh, in and around Toronto and learning from the designers of their experience. Designing our own, uh, designing or MacGyvering our own sensors and learning what that actual mechanism is from the, um, the actual uh, uh, components uh, all the way to uh, programming it um, and data analyzing it. Um, and then uh, ultimately th this kind of an interdisciplinary collaboration between students, th this kind of exchange of knowledge between all the, the science uh, students and the design students uh, together thinking about uh, new, um, new knowledges and, and uh, new methodologies. Um, this is just a couple of examples of how that kind of interdisciplinarity have produced uh, new ways of thinking. Um, we photograph our beds on a biweekly uh, basis and post them to our website. And we've developed, uh, we had the students work on essentially, um, I don't know if you can see up here, uh, a kind of a database that allows you to sort by all the different design factors. Um, and then a scroll, a time scroller, which allows you to see all the images of the beds, how they're doing uh, throughout the season and over the um, uh, seven year period. 
And then we were also really interested, and this was another assignment for the students as a kind of an interdisciplinary collaboration, looking at visually correlating discrete data sets, taking all the reams of data that we're getting essentially tabulated in an Excel spread, how might you actually visually uh, correlate that? So we were using Grasshopper as a way to uh, begin to construct these kind of um, forms that correlated uh, in red temperature input and output, i.e. cooling, uh, in blue uh, water input, precipitation, and then runoff, and then um, uh, cover as the full 360 circle, and then structure as in the height, and looking at if you have the different design factors, what would that look like, and trying to essentially see that all together. And then this is uh, on our website. You can visit that and see what, what, how that tool operates. And it actually gives you then, when you click on it, the specific temperature and what the outputs was or the differences between cooling and runoff and how that actually uh, fares relative to the Toronto standard. We also, with uh, the biology professor that I've been working with, looking at uh, interdisciplinary pedagogy and thinking about seminars, research seminars that fuse the kind of uh, uh, knowledge and approach in biology and ecology around uh, pollinator, pollinator habitats, um, and design approaches and processes. So we uh, came up with this course that was called Biomimetic Architecture, Analog Bee Habitats, uh, looking at particularly cavity nesters and beginning to draw where uh, certain bee species ne uh, nest uh, naturally, uh, typically in the stems of broken um, vegetation. And this was a kind of metadata uh, that each bee species is correlated to a specific diameter of a cavity. Uh, a sheathing material underneath. They have very specific uh, housing requirements. Uh, and looking at all of that, and this was a kind of on the, on the right, what my colleague uh, designs to do these kinds of tests around the city to look at where bees are nesting, i.e. the correlating building height to bee nesting with a GPS um, uh, recorder there. Uh, and in turn, our students together then built uh, these uh, uh, bee, uh, 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 bee habitats um, that looked at, uh, for instance, this would be um, something that would come uh, flat in a package, so it's laser cut, uh, designed specifically for um, a leaf cutter bee. Uh, with a specific, you know, diameter for the cavity. Um, it could be installed as a kind of a sculptural uh, element that could then be uh, taken apart, studied by a scientist, cleaned up, and then reinstalled again the following season. Another kind of idea was that uh, there is no science yet around what solar aspect bees actually prefer? Do they like their nest to be in the sun or away from the sun? Um, so this was a design of a decorative fence uh, into which there are cavity holes and following the solar aspect, this would be a repeated uh, design so that you would have the replicates to have the kind of a, a experimental design uh, study. So looking at, um, at the, the principles of experimental design, as I explained to you with regards to the test beds, these kinds of uh, various configurations and replication of test beds so that you have enough for statistical analysis, but in including that in a kind of a design approach of how do we make our landscapes an experiment onto themselves that could be tested, replicated, and provide statistical analysis and at the same time, aesthetics. This was a, an idea for a design for a carpenter bee. So carpenter bees usually borrow holes in decking and in nature and logs and so on. 
um, using a Japanese technique of actually charring wood for, uh, for waterproofing. Uh, this was this idea of looking at this uh, construction that would go over uh, hideous uh, concrete highway sound barriers um, and that would also provide the kind of uh, potential bee habitat. So where are we uh, headed next? Uh, we moved to uh, our own fancy uh, building, um, which uh, now has uh, a quite a, a, an amazing, a very unique site because we have our own island. <laughs> um, and subject to the Toronto wet weather flow, um, which now mandates 90% stormwater uh, retention. Um, and this is a common practice as well. We have a sub, uh, subterranean cistern to collect the water. And that is a common practice in, I'd say, most of the new buildings that are going up there um, because it's the kind of the sure engineering thing um, to put in for water management. Um, so this gives us a, a really unique uh, opportunity uh, and to date uh, there are no studies out there uh, looking at the reuse of cistern collected stormwater runoff in irrigation. So uh, Toronto and many other cities don't have any metrics or benchmarks for reuse uh, of water in, in irrigation. So we're, you're talking about everything that's collecting off of the sidewalk, uh, all the kind of hydrocarbons that you're getting from cars, uh, everything from eaves troughs and so on and so forth, ending in, um, in the cistern and then used for irrigation. And then one of the most prevalent problems, as you can imagine, is salt. Um, so what we're gonna do here is look at a comparison between cistern and domestic water supply for both water quality and quantity. Um, and another kind of new relationship that we forged is with forestry, um, looking at uh, amendments to soil, how can we actually optimize soil, and that's leading us into new and really interesting territory around uh, degraded urban soils that are nutrient poor, i.e. nitrogen poor, and looking at amendments for that. Green roof being not really a soil, but a growing media that doesn't have a lot of uh, nutrients uh, or water capacity for its shallow uh, depth. Um, the amendments could actually optimize performance and also uh, perhaps potentially deal with pollution abatement. Um, and then uh, given that this is a full uh, site and we have the water cistern, the idea of actually looking at best practices in full site water management, not just the green roof, how can we now think about all the different mechanisms working together? So you have the cistern, but it's full. So if you actually empty it out for irrigation, you're allowing for more water capture into the next rain event in the kind of wet months that we're getting back to back uh, rain events. So how do green roofs perform as part of the full site water strategy? Now we're kind of zooming out into um, site scale. So this is the latest and greatest. We're uh, still finishing construction of our uh, new uh, roof. We have 52 um, beds. Um, this was last summer, looking at um, the students constructing all the green roofs, blowing the soil onto the roof, uh, placing the uh, vegetation, uh, working with the irrigation, um, and what's interesting here are that we have the three irrigation lines with controllers that are actually activating whatever water supply we need for each bed, the cistern, the domestic, and then combination uh, of the two. And this is a, an aerial image of the new roof uh, under construction last summer. Uh, we'll be instrumenting that uh, in the coming summer and um, so on. Um, most recently, we received a large grant to start a new program, uh, one of a kind uh, in green infrastructure. Um, so this would be 
uh, a six-year program, 60 students, four universities across uh, Canada, eight international universities in Japan, um, um, uh, Israel, France, uh, the US, um, and Australia uh, that all have green infrastructure labs where students could go on exchange programs um, and training essentially in an interdisciplinary manner, 60 students that will go out into the field in various capacities in green infrastructure, looking at the kind of the next generation of professionals that are, that are needed to move the, um, this, uh, this, this kind of uh, uh, idea around urbanism forward. Um, and the other thing that, uh, is, that we're looking at is what is, an, again, another unique opportunity in our building, which has a building automated system. And how do we begin to look at sensor technologies feeding into different building automation systems and working with facilities to look at adaptive uh, management, um, which are uh, big questions around, um, around performance uh, sort of optimization. And then lastly, looking at um, what's the kind of the potential of the campus as living lab? Um, we are already, well, we've already taken over two buildings, so why not continue? Um, I'm working right now with uh, U of T uh, planning to look at the 120 buildings uh, on campus and the downtown campus alone to look at the potential for uh, retrofitting some of these buildings and looking at, at the, the kind of, uh, uh, you know, the, the fact that the university is, is essentially a single landowner, uh, not having to uh, be subject to all sorts of different private owners and properties, uh, has amazing capacity to do experiments on their own buildings and sites, and that's something that I'm trying to advocate along with a few other colleagues um, at the university. So scaling up these ideas and then thinking about what could the studies be around a kind of a district scale, block scale, and so on, how do we begin to look at not just individual roofs or individual uh, material configurations, but what does that mean on, uh, when, you, when you begin to scale that up? In conclusion, what I wanted to share with you are, are some of my thoughts. Uh, you know, what, what is the role of experimental laboratories in design schools? And, to, particularly to explore environmental performance and also engage in dialogues on sustainability and climate action. And I think there, in my mind, there are really, you know, uh, these kind of four important principles around multi-sectorial uh, engagement that is really necessary to bring the kind of the conversations into the academy and then back out into what's happening in policy, what's happening in industry and to uh, acknowledge that there are knowledges and expertise in all these different sectors that we have to correlate uh, together. Interdisciplinary collaboration is really a must if we're gonna look at these kind of multi-objective, multi-performance aspects that we're all really interested in uh, with respect to water, energy, uh, 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 the uh, bi biology and the kind of ecology and so on, and to really think about how do we build these platforms that would allow us to uh, work together and exchange uh, new modes for research and teaching. Uh, empirical research seems to me really a kind of a, 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 a also another important uh, uh, method of actually understanding learning, uh, kind of a learning by doing uh, mechanism of really understanding uh, green technologies, um, revealing the, the nuances as they relate to different uh, climate regions and, and uh, urban regions and conditions. Um, and then ultimately the kind of this, this notion of how do you uh, create a platform for innovation? How do you, what are the kind of the mechanisms for these knowledge transfer, which are uh, undoubtedly really, really difficult when we're all having to adhere to the kind of the disciplinary scope and limitations of our schooling and uh, promotions and 
uh, and professional accreditations and uh, licensure and so on and so forth, how do we uh, allow for these experimentations to uh, purposefully break those silos? So I'll leave those uh, thoughts with you and I'm uh, very uh, happy to take your questions. Thank you. I mean, I, I think so. It depends, I guess. Um, you know, you know, if if we had more time, <laughs> I think you know where um, where the gap is um, primarily. Uh, to be honest with you, is actually with the professionals, um, and the industry oftentimes based on my sort of conversations, is following what they're being asked to do. Um, so even some of the more progressive green roof companies that were trying to push different materials uh, ended up with the kind of common uh, configuration because they were pushed uh, by the professionals um, to specify certain materials. Um, so the, the education, I think, needs to go back um, to you know, firms, um, maybe even go back to um, you know, uh, cross-referencing things like LEED or you know, other things that, allow, that in, in many cases uh, force designers to sort of check a box rather than think about this more synthetically and comprehensively and look at all the kind of the, you know, interdependencies between systems. So I think that's, that's one, one aspect. I look at what we do and maybe the campus as a testing ground only in so far that it, it you know, seeing is believing and having demo sites and prototypes um, have always proven to be very effective in having a cultural shift. Um, when you show people that it works, um, they easily change their mind. So, uh, you know, given the kind of willingness of uh, facilities and UFT planning uh, to implement, I mean, we'll see, <laughs> we've yet to see, um, but we have built a kind of credibility with these two facilities. So now we're, um, you know, uh, we, we, we have the, um, the relationship uh, to do so. Uh, but, I, but I think that, that having enough uh, kind of a, a critical mass of a demonstration, demonstration sites showing that you know this is the way forward and it's possible and and so on um you know may, may be an important step i mean to, another thing that i didn't mention um so the green roof bylaw is for new construction uh toronto has an incentive program which is a, an amazing program like many other cities that incentivizes the retrofit of existing programs and last I checked, since 2009, uh, less than 50 buildings. I mean, at the time that I checked, it was like 29. Uh, so let's say there's a few more since then. But certainly, uh, of the hun you know, I mean, we're talking about the fourth largest city in Toronto. Hundreds of buildings uh, that, you know, uh, I mean hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of buildings that could be eligible 
uh, for a green roof retrofit, which would actually aggregated together would make an enormous impact on the urban environment uh, and no takers and it's I would argue that it's not so much a money question uh, but it's a it's a belief uh, and so the culture has not really um, you know really changed uh, and that's really where I think the main impact would be because still relative to the, uh, the urban footprint, the new construction since 2009 is relatively, you know, it's a fraction. So that, I think that the, that would be a real kind of major, you know, forward is, is how to um, do a, a much more comprehensive study and thinking about mobilization around retrofitting and, and, and uh, through demonstration and also through communication. It's a really good question. Um, I would say, you know, and I don't, uh, I can't answer this with absolute certainty because it's not really my field, but I would say that with for new construction, the load capacity is not really an issue. Um, and and so you can actually, you, you know, the, the kind of loads w in addition to the green roof, they're already designed for snow loads that are, that are quite extreme. Um, and so the green roof addition is not um, is not um, significant. Um, in retrofit, um, that is more of an issue. Um, and so a, a few things around that. The organic media that we found was actually a lot lighter in waste in weight. So relative to the aggregate that's being used, I mean it's stone. <laughs> It's, it's rock, um, that there's another argument for using the organic media, um, you know, for, for retrofit uh, conditions. Um, the, the other thing um, to, to sort of con consider is, uh, and, and I saw this in a, in a project in Toronto, is looking at uh, sort of point loading. Right, so where you have columns and load-bearing walls, you can actually have uh, deeper soil and you know maybe shallower, really thin soil uh, in the spans. Um, and thirdly, um, you know, part part of the the reason that we're looking at soil amendments is because the industry is already moving to this, what we call, how low can you go? Uh, everybody wants to go to the thinnest. And, I, and, and it makes sense because material is money. Uh, the more material you have, the more cost it will be. Not even, you know, notwithstanding structural capacity, just the material that's needed for the green roof itself. The shallower you make it, the cheaper it is. Um, and, um, and, and so we are seeing a lot of roofs that are uh, actually two and a half inches, you know, in depth. Um, and they're not surviving, so that's another study that we're now doing, just surveying what, what's still alive. Um, but uh, but the, the, the kind of looking at, again, how can you make this, this, the growing media even better 
uh, as it gets shallower uh, um, is, is, a, is another question that pertains to both you know, material costs and life cycle costs, uh, environmental impacts, but also load capacity uh, for retrofit. I, I hope that answered some of your Sure, thank you so much.